In this video, I want to address some myths that go around in counterfeit Christianity regarding curses and spirits. Earlier today, I received um, an email with someone who I have been communicating with for a while. And one of the things that he said to me is that um, he and someone else had come to the conclusion that doing inner child work aloud would invoke demons. And that might sound a little strange to some of you. To others, you might totally know where that is in counterfeit Christianity, things like it. But these are the things that are taught in counterfeit Christianity. There's a complete lack of understanding. Um, there is, it seems to be that people are receiving their education through books that people have written on spirits because they made some sort of name for themselves, not for God, because they're definitely not based on the word of God. Um, and people just basically making up their own theology and also Hollywood, which is a really scary thing that we should be getting anything from Hollywood. The word of God tells us that we are handed over to the spirits that we choose through sin. God is a respecter of choice. And in truth, part of what we're doing here in working out our covenant is we're making an active lived decision of who we're going to choose who we are choosing to rule over us, who we are choosing to inhabit us. And because we have been made as a vessel, we're going to be inhabited by something, either God or Satan. However, don't misunderstand that Satan is allowed to just attack you and hammer you and that he makes the decisions and he has the power. No, God has the power. And in 1 Samuel 16, 14, we see that very clearly. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Where's the evil spirit from? The Lord. And why did he send it? To torment him. And we know why he does this. First of all, because it's the spirit that we chose. We rejected him we chose this other spirit. Even in choosing self, there is no real self apart from whatever's inhabiting us. So we've chosen that spirit in rejecting God, in choosing our own desires, etc. Now in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, we're told why this is. Why is it that God does this? Paul was rebuking the church because a man had been having sex with his father's wife. And they all knew about it, and they were all gossiping about it, and some of them thought it was funny. And Paul rebuked them for that. And he said, when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Because what happens? When you're handed over to that spirit that you've chosen and God's dealing with you on your sin and you are bearing the consequences of your sin, because that's what a good parent does. They let you bear the consequences of your behavior. They give you logical consequences for your behavior. So you stop doing that thing that is going to kill you. And if that sounds dramatic, I mean, what are we doing here? These are the things that are going to kill us. If we live for the gratifications of our flesh, we will not live. We will forsake eternal life. And so the context of flesh here, and I talk about this in a soul aligned, there's a concept called sarx, um, excuse me, it is the word sarx in Greek, and it refers to the sinful state of human beings. So remember, there's two types of flesh. There's the physical flesh in which you live. That's the part where you're supposed to be disciplined. There is the sinful flesh in which you, from which you are supposed to be totally cut off. You can't be disciplined and cut off in the same place. So there's got to be two types of flesh that the word is talking about. And here, the context, the little footnote after flesh, indicates that he could be talking about either one. But let's take a look at this for a minute because they both interact. If you're living in your physical flesh, you are living according to your sinful flesh. You have to live in your heart and spirit. You cannot live in the very place that is undisciplined because if God says to discipline it, how will you ever discipline it? When I was handed over to the consequences of my sinful behavior, for the consequences, to endure the consequences, to bear the consequences of my sinful behavior, and I was so incredibly sick for seven years to the point of death, God was 
destroying my flesh. He was bringing me to a position where I started to loathe all of the things that I had been choosing over him, where I even loathed food, right? You know, God talks about this in Job, or Elihu talks about it, God through Elihu. So let's read the context of that because Elihu has understanding. And by the way, this is at the beginning of the word that they had understanding. So anyone who thinks that we don't need to understand the Old Testament in order to understand the new, please reconsider that. Elihu had understanding and he reproved Job and he said, you've said in my hearing that God doesn't listen, that God doesn't respond, but God is listening and he is responding all the time. He begins to describe someone that sounds a little like my situation. <laughs> I mean, the first time I read this, I was blown away. I, it took me so many times of reading this to not get, you know, just sob over it. It's, it was like my story was written right here. So this is uh, Job 33, and I'm going to start in verse 19. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones, so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Now, let me tell you something. The only thing that I could eat was beef. I ate ribeyes every single day. That was the only thing that I could eat. I would cut it up, you know, into small pieces, and that's what I would eat. You know, that's a pretty choice meal. But when that's the only thing that you can eat, and even that starts, you start having reactions to that, you kind of start to loathe the choicest meal. You have so much anxiety around food. Their flesh wastes away to nothing, and their bones, once hidden, now stick out. They draw near the pit and their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, spare them from going down to the pit. I've found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. This is my story, you guys. I testify that this is true. He will restore them to full well-being and they will go to others and say, what do I do? What am I doing? I go to others and say, I have sinned. I have perverted what is right, but I did not get what I deserved. God has delivered me from going down to the pit and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. Can you understand why this story made me sob every time I would read it? Verse 29, God does all these things to a person twice, even three times, to turn them back from the pit, that the light of life may shine on them. Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak up, for I want to vindicate you. But if not, then listen to me. Be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. And indeed, Elihu had wisdom. This is exactly my story. This is my story to a T. So let me ask you something. Why did he do that to me? He handed me over for the destruction of my flesh. And in doing that, both were broken. Nothing else matters when you're writing your will at 40 years old. You're writing letters to your child to tell them how to take care of certain things. And you're trying to think of what to say to them. And you're understanding that your sin was more important than anything else. You start to loathe it. It breaks the power of the flesh. When you can't even get out of bed without having to move super slowly for a couple hours a day, or you're gonna pass out, vomit, or break out in blistering hives. And God had a reason for that too, because he said to me, you will rest. I had spent so many years of my life, if not all of my life, in a constant state of panic and fear. And I channeled it into being productive for the world. And I achieved a lot for the world. And where did it get me? In a bed, dying. So by the time God began teaching me and counseling me about what I needed to do, by the time that angel at my side taught me how to be upright, I had been brought into position. The flesh had been circumcised and my physical body had been disciplined, my body and my mind. And now God began to speak to me and tell me, you're about to unlearn everything you, you think you know. That's my story. So this, I want you to understand very clearly that there is 
tons of biblical precedent for this. The fact that God says, I will bless you for obedience and punish you for disobedience. And then he goes into all of this story about what he's going to do. We have to start making these connections between our personal responsibility, our sin, and the consequences of bearing our sin. But it seems like counterfeit Christianity would prefer to think of things in a woo-woo way that does not make sense whatsoever. No one's allowed to send curses to you. God sends curses. So if someone's doing some sort of voodoo or you go see a psychic or something like that and you receive that, that's your sin. That is not the power of that psychic or some delusional person who thinks they're doing, you know, some sort of voodoo or curse, you know, sending curses. No person can do that. God does that. He sends curses to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. How does he know you hate him? Because you keep choosing things that are in opposition to him. Why do spirits inhabit you? Because you're handed over to them when that's what you choose. You are not going to say some weird thing out loud and then a spirit is going to be able to occupy you. Now, I want to say something else. Some people are misunderstanding the purpose of the books that I have written. And so I want to give you a biblical precedent to understand why it is that I am speaking the way that I do and why it is I teach what I teach because I'm not teaching another psychobabble method of how to heal yourself. When Jesus came here, the people already had the law. They already had a certain outline of what they were to do, but they started distorting it. They started using it to their own advantage. They started using it to justify themselves and to condemn others. And so when Jesus was here, he started clarifying things and he started saying, yeah, You've, you've heard it said in the law that you shall not murder, but if you hate a brother, you're committing murder. You've heard it said, thou shall not commit adultery. But a man who lusts after another woman has committed adultery. He also taught that a man who gives his wife a certificate of divorce causes her to commit adultery. He was teaching practical understanding and bringing them a layer deeper into understanding. The apostles were doing likewise. Don't think I'm comparing myself to Christ. That is not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is helping you to understand that there is biblical precedent for what I'm doing. God established the way a family was to be. He established the way children were to be raised, that you raise up a child in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. A mother is supposed to be spiritually nourishing her children. A father is supposed to be doing likewise, but he does it in a different way. I was talking with someone earlier this morning who was having difficulty even identifying her childhood feelings and her childhood needs because there was no father in the home. There was no structure in the home because one person cannot do the job of two parents. That's why God gave you two parents. And so now you have a person who's having difficulty even identifying their feelings and being able to bring themselves correctly to God because they're not capable. There is a block in being able to do the work that is necessary that God requires in personal accountability to examine, to soothe, to talk yourself through, to remind yourself of what is true. And that starts to prohibit you from being able to get into the heart and spirit because now you're in the flesh and the flesh is trying to squelch it because it's too painful. And so you have people who can't even tap into their feelings because they don't even know what that looks like. And if you can't do that, you're gonna live in the flesh and it's going to be a place that Satan keeps squeezing into. He, He keeps slithering into that little chink in your armor. In a healthy, spiritual home, you would have learned these things with a mother and a father. A father would have been providing certain structure. A mother would have been providing other structure. They would have been spiritually nourishing you in different ways. And so that would have developed something inside of you that would have facilitated you being able to have a healthy relationship with God. Why do you think there are so many people? You know, I talked on a video not that long ago about uh, someone I know who goes to a counterfeit Christian university and they have a professor who is a, a, you know, trained pastor, but moved over to psychology. Why do you think that is? Why are there so many wounded people in God's church? If there's a solution for healing, I'll tell you why, because people are not understanding what God established in a family and what needs to be built in you. So all I'm teaching you in, in this inner child work not as the world does it, by the way. The only thing I am teaching you 
is how to develop those parts of yourself that should have been developed, but were not because of the increase in wickedness in this world, because people are working for the world rather than being with their children and raising them in the way that they should go so that when they are older, they will not depart from it. You need that development in order to be able to take personal accountability and bring yourself to God in heart and spirit rather than in the flesh, which he detests. I'm not going to answer you there. I mean, period. You have to understand that. If you're in your flesh and you're desperately bringing yourself to him in a, in a desperate, entitled, unaccountable way, you're screaming out spirits, you're pleading the blood, you don't even have understanding of what it is that he requires, why you're being handed over to these things, how you're supposed to be examining your sin, how you need to soothe yourself in order to get to a place so that you can actually deal with your shame instead of running from it. That is what I'm teaching. And I'm teaching it based on scripture. It is not a replacement for scripture. It is based on scripture and it is not an extension of scripture. I am simply explaining to you what this looks like in practical application. What does it look like to do the things that God talked about when he was here? What does it look like to bring yourself correctly to God? I'm never speaking on my own authority. I am always, even in these videos, shepherding you back to him. My concern is that there are people who are taking this as one more nostrum. You know what a nostrum is? It's, it's a, you know, one more panacea, one more healing solution of the world rather than understanding why it is that I'm teaching this and how it stands on what God has laid out, what he has established in terms of how we're supposed to bring ourselves to him, in terms of how we're supposed to examine ourselves and take responsibility, in terms of how we're supposed to develop that part of ourselves and how that would have been developed in a spiritually healthy home as he established a spiritually healthy home, as he commanded us to live. If that's what you're doing with the books, please consider this. If you are treating those books as though they are one more healing method and you're not comprehending why that method is necessary according to God and what he has established, you're engaging in idolatry again. And how can you expect to heal if you're treating this like Dr. Horn's method? It's not my method. I might call it a thing. I might call it inner child work. But what you're doing, the only reason I call it that, by the way, and I prayed about this a lot because I didn't really want to associate anything with methods of the world. Even as I, you know, as God told me the the title, A Soul Aligned, I think I've, I've told you in other videos when I started to Google the book after it had been published, you know what comes up? A bunch of new age occult stuff. And so I was really upset and I went back to God and I said, why did you have me name it that? Did I, did I hear you wrong? Because I didn't even know what a soul was. So I didn't, I didn't come up with that on my own. By the way, new age and occult does not know what a soul is either. And the answer that he gave me is to keep using his language, that they have distorted his language and they don't get to covet what a soul is. Soul was established in Genesis. They don't get to take that. And so likewise, when Christ says, become like a child, and I am now talking about inner child work, the world does not get to covet what a child is. And so it, what, it is appropriate that I continue to refer to it in that, in that way. Everything needs a name or something, some way to refer to it. But understand this, I'm not creating a construct. These ideas were already established by God. The way in which we were supposed to develop was already established by God when he designed us. So the correct way for you to be going through those books is to understand, listen to what I'm saying in there. I am citing scripture constantly. In fact, that's probably the bulk of the book. How many times do I cite scripture in there? Because I'm not speaking on my own authority. I cite the scripture and then I help you to understand. Now here's what it looks like. What did Jesus do when he was here? He cites the law and then he helps you to understand what it looks like. What did the apostles do? They'd cite the law and then they'd help you to understand the fulfillment of the law. Please understand my heart. It's really important to me that you understand what I'm standing on. 
This is not my teaching. This is not my authority. It is not for my glory. I demonstrate that to you every day. I give you the books for free. I extend workshops to you for free. I make videos for you every single day for free. If I'm standing on my, my own authority for my own glory. You tell me what glory am I getting? What notoriety? What reputation? Because the world hates this message and they hate me for sharing it. What motivation would I have to speak on the world's, <laughs> on the world's authority and mix that with God? I'm not getting anything out of this. Please understand because what's in your heart, remember, it's not me. I'm not going to bring curses on you or sin or anything else just as much as no one else is able to do that to you. So what I am urging you to do is to make sure that you are approaching the work correctly, that it does stand on the word of God, that you understand that this is not in addition to the scroll. I am explaining and illustrating what God requires. And I'm illustrating it based on the way he did it with me. If there's another way that he's doing it with you, then go for it. But I'm just standing on my own testimony that God built in me. That is the reason why I tell you to fast first. That's the reason why I tell you to pray first and make sure that I am a shepherd of God. That's the reason I pr tell you to pray first before you even get those books so that you can make sure that he is telling you to do this work. He is the one that's testifying to it because what's in your heart matters. You have to make sure that he is the one who has told that has led you to this, not me. That is a heart issue. If you do it just because of me, you're doing it in idolatry. You have to be led by his spirit. If you're doing it because you think this is what's going to heal you, you're in idolatry. This is not what's going to heal you. This is your personal accountability is what's required in order for him to heal you. You need a way to do that. So look, that would have been developed in a parental relationship and that is parental relationship would have been internalized and then having been raised in the way you should go, you would not depart from it. That would be a part of you. Now that you're an adult, you are required to develop those parts of you that did not develop correctly. Those parts of you that were not shepherded correctly because truth is not being exercised in this world right now. That is simply what you're doing in inner child and inner parent work. You're not healing yourself. You're not even sealing up the chinks in your armor. You're doing your part, then he does his part. You do your part, then he does his part. Is that not the covenant that we have with him? I hope this has helped you to understand, first of all, no one can invoke a spirit except for God. He's the only one who sends spirits. No one can send a curse on you or put a curse on you. Only God does that. And look, if you are questioning either one of those statements... Show me in scripture where someone else put a curse on another person. Show me in scripture where something a person said out loud or another person said, you know, put a curse. I mean, there, there have been plenty of Satan worshipers in the Bible. You show me. Where did they send a, a spirit? Where did they send a curse? Where did they have the power to do these things? Because the Bible I'm reading says, I am the Lord. I do all these things. He sends blessing. He sends punishment. He sends destruction. He created the light and he also created the darkness. He is the one who has power, all power. I also help, hope that it has helped you to understand the work that I'm teaching in these books and how you need to approach it because these things are a heart issue. If you think this is in addition to the scroll in any way, don't do it because that's in your heart. You got to receive from God that this is what he, that, he, that he's testifying to this because my heart is not to make any addition to the scroll. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Please ask questions. If you have questions about this, ask them. That's what I'm here for. I've made myself available. And so if I don't hear from you, it kind of wastes the gift I'm giving to you. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.